Uh, so I'd like to tell you about this organization, how it, uh, how it came to be, what its purposes are, who's involved with it, uh, and what we think we've accomplished in its brief existence so far. Uh, then if I have time, I'd like to also tell you something about a Canadian rare disease consortium that we've been able to assemble that we're quite proud of, that we think has been very successful in the area of gene discovery. And it was interesting to hear uh, from, uh, from Pedro, I guess, that there seems that there's a similar consortium that's assembled here and that that's like to be, might be amusing to, to compare how those came to be and, and, and what they're doing. And finally, at the end of the talk, I'll tell you about some initiatives that are going on within IRDIC to try to give you some sense of where the organization is, is trying to go as we transition from its foundation stage to a stage where we hope to be more, where we expect to be more active in, uh, in, in facilitating rare disease research. So I'm going to push this button in the hope that the slide advances. That's good. So the first discussions about IRDIC took place in 2010. Uh, there was a meeting in Reykjavik, Iceland, uh, that was attended by Francis Collins, uh, who's the head of the U.S. National Institutes of Health, and Roxandra Dragia Agli, who uh, has already been mentioned. She was the head of the Health Directorate at the European Commission, and she in particular deserves a lot of credit for getting Irdik off the ground. Uh, she really drove the initiative, I think, in its early years, and she was the acting director. So she was essentially my predecessor as the, as the chair of IRDIC. I took over last year. And when you, we looked at the field of rare disease research in 2010, what people saw was that, there, first, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of research going on in this area, but I think somewhat it's inherent in this field that there are something like 7,000 rare diseases. And in the old days, when to discover a, gene, a disease gene was a big laborious project. It was a positional cloning project or it was a SNP mapping project. It took many person years of efforts. And so these projects tended to be very secretive because one wanted your effort to be rewarded at the end with a publication. So researchers were quite... Uh, guarded their patient samples very carefully and were very careful and uh, reluctant to share information. And so research in the field was quite fragmented. And that was maybe a natural result of the field focusing on many different diseases. Uh, there, as you, and I'll show some data for this before, there were and still remain big variations among different countries as to the availability of diagnostics and therapeutics for rare disease for, for many different reasons. And what was also emerging in 2010 was next generation sequencing. So that was a huge technological breakthrough that lowered the cost of determining a genome sequence by a factor of 100 or 1,000. And therefore, by bringing the cost of doing a, a genome sequence or an exome sequence down to a, a few thousand of your favorite currency units, or euros or dollars, um, it for, for the first time made diagnostic genome sequencing or, or exome sequencing, at least in the context of a research project, completely feasible. So that meant that to discover a new disease gene need no longer be a multi-year process uh, that involved lots of money and lots of people, but is something that could actually be done quite rapidly from a trio of patients or even sometimes from a, from a single, a family trio or sometimes even from a single patient. So because of those things, it was felt, and this was really the driving motivation for forming IRDIC, was that if we could improve collaboration and coordination internationally in this field, then research would be better facilitated. And by improving research in this field, and also by if we could improve better, uh, if we could improve research collaboration, we might also improve therapeutic collaboration, and that might reduce inequities for patients. So that was really the driving force behind the formation of, of, of IRDIC. So IRDIC came together. 
Uh, and its intention is to foster cooperation at the international level uh, to stimulate, to better coordinate, and to maximize the output of rare disease research efforts all over the world. So the basic principles of the organization is that IRDIC now has many members, and I'll go through who are members of IRDIC in a few minutes. And the members of IRDIC are funding organizations. They can be public organizations, they can be companies, they can be charities. Um, the threshold value for joining IRDIC is a commitment of at least $10 million US over a five-year period in rare disease research. Okay? And as I think you probably can appreciate from Pedro's talk, the at, once a country or once a funder makes that commitment, that brings money behind it. And Spain has been a noteworthy example, but not the only example of funders making a commitment and then turning out to greatly exceed that commitment. So we think that one of the real, um, one of the real accomplishments of IRDIC is simply to bring more research funding into the rare disease arena. Okay? Um, I'm often asked to fund things as chair of IRDIC, <laughs> and it would be nice to say yes, but that's not how the organization works. So it's a consortium of funders each funder still makes its own decisions about funding and funds its research in its own way. So IRDIC, when a funder joins IRDIC, they don't give the $10 million to me, unfortunately, to decide what to do with it. Uh, rather, they retain the capability of funding research in their own country, in their own areas that they've prioritized, using their own peer review and, and, and other processes. But nevertheless, what we try to do in the organization is to better coordinate where the money's being spent in different places. And each funder member who joins IRDIC has signed on to a common set of policies and guidelines that it then, that it then obligates its scientists to in turn follow. And those have to do with data sharing to the extent feasible, to publication of data, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll go through those in, in, a, in a little while. So the organization also, upon its founding, uh, set itself some pretty ambitious goals. And one was that it would foster the development of 200 new therapies for rare disease by the end of this decade, and also uh, provide the means to diagnose most rare diseases by the end of this decade. And in practical terms, what we mean by that for since about 90 percent, 85 or 90 percent of rare diseases are Mendelian genetic diseases, in practical terms, what we mean by that is identification of the causative gene for those diseases by the end of the decade. So, where is, what is the current state of research in this field now? And in order to try to present that to you, I've asked. Um, for we've, we've compiled some data from Orphanet, which, as many of you know, is a kind of world resource for information in rare disease. Uh, and so we've compiled some relevant data. Uh, and this, is, this, this was done in February, so this is, this is pretty recent. Uh, and so, as you can see, there's a lot of research going on in rare disease. 50, we, Orphanet counts 5,700 ongoing research projects just in Europe, uh, covering over 2,000 rare diseases, and that excludes clinical trials. And this same number, when I last asked the Secretariat to compile it uh, a couple of years ago, was 4,200. So as you can see, uh, the act research activity in this area is increasing at a pretty good level, maybe 30 percent more research projects now than two years ago. And you can see there's a big diversity of different kinds of research projects going on. I don't think I'll go through all those numbers uh, for, for the sake of time. Um, these are the data that we discussed. And this is how many different rare diseases can be diagnosed in each European country. And as you can see, there's a huge, I, don't, I hope you can read these numbers, um, there's a huge variation among the different countries in Europe. So the red countries 
Uh, there are diagnostic tests available for over a thousand diseases. The, orange, the light red or dark orange countries are between 599. The light orange countries are 100 to 499, and the yellow ones are, are less than 100. Uh, and actually, Spain has quite a high number on this, on this graph. So according to Orphanet, uh, 1,855 diagnostics are available in Spain. So Spain is actually second only to Germany uh, in terms of the number of diseases that can be diagnosed here. Now, Orphanet has not tried to break this down for Catalonia. So, no, so seriously, that would be an interesting thing to do because that doesn't sound like the same. Uh, I don't know if that's the same sort of data you have, but, but they seem to, uh, according to these data, Spain is actually one of the leaders in, in rare disease diagnostics. So good job. Uh, but as you can see, there's a huge amount of variation. So here's, a, uh, I guess, so you know, in Poland there are only 300, in the Czech Republic there are only 280, in Slovakia there's only 100, in Ireland there are less than 50. So there is a there is a big difference among uh, the different European countries uh, in the area of diagnostics. Uh, and this, these numbers are very small, but this also tracks the increase. And here it actually looks like Spain was one of the countries that increased, has increased very rapidly. So in 2010, I think that says 594 for Spain. And by 2011, it was over 1,000, and now it's 1,635. So there has been a, a really rapid increase. In Germany as well, there's 1,200 in 2010 and 1,800 something in 2013. Uh, and it's very heartening to see in some countries where there were very few at the beginning of this graph. For instance, I think that's, uh, test my geography, that's Austria. Uh, there were only 103 in 2010, and now there are 665 uh, last year. So there has been improvement in the number of diagnostics, but still huge differences between the western part of the EU and the eastern part of, of, of Europe where the numbers are still in the two-digit zone. Uh, the picture is not as happy for new medicinal projects, uh, products becoming available in Europe. So here's a graph over the, from 2002 to 2013 uh, with the numbers of orphan uh, medicinal products that have been approved by EMA with European, the approved for marketing in Europe with an orphan drug designation. And while there's been an increase over the first two years on this chart, you know, it's really hard to say that since 2006, there's been too much better than a flat trend. So we're getting somewhere between, you know, an average of maybe six or seven new medicinal projects per year uh, since 2006, and we're not yet seeing any kind of a big increase, which is, which is so the development of new therapeutics is lagging behind, I suppose many of you realize this, the development of new therapeutics in this area is lag hasn't seen the kind of increase that the development of new diagnostics have seen in the last few years. Okay. When we break down what's going on in clinical trials in Europe in rare disease, again, you see there are a lot of them. So there are almost 2,500 ongoing national or international clinical trials going on in rare disease in Europe. 629 different diseases are under study. Uh, a lot of people come and tell me, well, you know, all the therapeutic activity is, is directed against a few of the most common rare diseases. You know, that argues that that's not strictly the case. There, there, you know, something's going on for 600, some clinical trials going on for over 600 diseases in Europe involving 29 different countries in Europe. The vast majority of these are still drug clinical trials, so 78% of them are drug clinical trials. And the second biggest category are clinical trials of new protocols, new treatment protocols for people. I draw your attention to what I like to call innovative therapy, so cell therapy or gene therapy, uh, vaccine or medical device. Those, I think, are very important areas. I think especially when we start thinking about the ultra-rare diseases, it's hard to imagine 
how the economy will support billion dollar drug development projects for ultra rare diseases that affect a handful of people. Um, the excitement, I think, about some of the innovative therapies like exon skipping, like antisense RNA, like stop codon read through, like gene therapy, is that they're potentially generalizable. You're treating the gene as opposed to the specific disease or the specific protein that's produced by the gene. And once, those tech, once one of those technologies really takes off, although they're being developed for relatively common diseases like Duchenne's, they really do have the capability of being extrapolated to a lot of different diseases. And I think the real hope for the ultra rare area is to the development of those technologies, even though the initial therapeutics that come from those technologies will be directed against the more common diseases because the market is bigger and the economies work better for that. Okay, so that's the present context in the area. I think we're seeing good improvement in diagnostic development. Uh, we're seeing good improvement with getting those diagnostics out to patients, not so much yet in the area of therapeutics. So how has, so let's turn back to IRDIC now and talk a little bit about how the organization developed. So this was an article, News and Views article that was published in Nature in 2011, and this was the first public discussion of IRDIC. So this reported upon the meeting between the NIH and the European Com Com Commission. This resulted from the rec -EVIC meeting that I mentioned before, and so this was the first public indication that this organization was going to form. Uh, what happened after that is we had there was a second coordination meeting that was held in Bethesda in the spring of 2011, and that's where the Institute of Health Carlos III joined, and that's also where Canada joined. So I attended that meeting, and my colleague Pierre Moulien from Genome Canada uh, also attended that meeting. And we made, at, following that meeting, Canada, the two organizations made a joint commitment of $25 million, which we've also been able to exceed. Uh, since then, not by as much as you, though. Uh, so the initial country, and then the third, we agreed as well to hold the next coordination meeting in Montreal toward the end of 2011, and this one was attended by about 100 people, so this was the first kind of semi-public meeting where we invited a lot of researchers to help kind of drive the development of this organization and start hammering out how this organization would be governed and what it would do. So by this time, the countries that were involved were the European Commission, the NIH from the States, Canada, I explained that, Spain, you've already heard, and Italy through Teleton had been involved at that point. And shortly after, we got our first two private members, uh, Shire joined shortly after, as did Prosenso, which is an exon skipping company that's based in the Netherlands. So as I've said before, all the funders commit a minimum of $10 million to rare disease research. As you'll see, we have, I think, 36 funder members now, so this organization has grown quite a lot. And the aggregate commitment from all those funders is well over a billion dollars. It's probably getting close to $2 billion. I, I need to add that up. So this is a, co a collection of most, not all, but many of, most of the major funders in this area, I would say, and the sum of money that these organizations are all committing to rare disease is really very substantial. The organization, oops, the organization had a formal launch in, let's get the buttons right, Paul. The organizations had a formal launch in, in 2012, and its first actual public symposium uh, was only held last year uh, in Dublin. So April of last year was the first open meeting of, of the organization where anyone could attend. And uh, one of our, one of the organizations that's joined more recently is the BGI, which was formerly known as the Beijing Genomics Institute, but now that they're not in Beijing anymore, they don't call themselves that. Uh, but as many of you probably know, that's the, it's a private enterprise, but it has the largest sequencing capacity of anything in the world. Uh, that organization has joined, and they also kindly agreed to uh, be the major sponsor for a second IRDIC symposium that's going to happen in Shenzhen in China uh, in November of this year. 
So the organization has also become increasingly global. And as I said, what we're all trying to do is increase research volume, which we clearly are doing. Uh, we're trying to boost collaboration between researchers, and I'll make some arguments that we are doing that. And by doing the thir first two things, we'll do the third thing, which is to speed up research and therapeutic development in this area. So we've got these goals of, two th two of lots of new diagnostics and 200 new therapeutics. So two or three years into the organization, how is it looking like we're doing toward reaching those goals? So this graph, it's now a little bit out of date. It's taking gene discovery through to the end of 2012. And here you can see the impact of next-gen sequencing on gene discovery. So this is the number of disease-causing genes that have been f discovered because of whole genome sequencing. And there were none in 2009, so this technique came on board in 2010, and you had like three of them in the first half and 12 or so in the second half. And you can see that this ramped up to 150 or so during 2012, 75 in each half of the year. The numbers for 2013 are a little higher, but not a whole lot higher. So this was the big inflection point. Uh, so that looks really good, right? Um, only problem is there are something like 7,000 rare diseases, maybe somewhat less, and I can get into a good uh, argument over a beer as to what, how we should define a disease and how many of these diseases there really are. But there are, let's say, 3,000 more to be discovered. If we're getting them at, say, 200 a year, that's 15 more years to get the rest of them, and 2020 is only six years away. <laughs> so although this is wonderful progress, this pace is going to have to get up here somewhere. We've got to triple this, or at least double this, uh, in order for that 2020 goal to be met, which is why we need to get more research going on in this area, because here I think we do pretty well have technologies established now, and this is a matter of getting resources together. It's also getting to be, and I'll get back to this at the end of the talk, increasingly a matter of improving collaboration because the genes that we're missing are increasingly going to be the genes for really ultra rare diseases. Diseases where there might be one family in Canada and one family in Barcelona and one family someplace in China that have the disease. And if you don't have mechanisms for the researchers and the clinicians who are working with those three families to ever find each other and realize that they're working on the same thing, you won't discover those genes. Uh, and here, I guess I just this is a p the point I made from a table, but I made this point before, um, but the rate of approvals for new orphan therapeutics is not increasing. So here you see this has still remained pretty linear. Uh, even the, these are, again, plotting EMA approvals over time. and there's only the slightest hint of an upward, uh, I don't think three reviewers would, would agree that that's an upward trend on that, on that line yet, but maybe the beginnings of an upward trend are, are happening here. So this, we want to flip that inflection curve as well. And I should, before I go on, just credit Kim Boycott and her colleagues. I'll mention Kim again later in the talk. Kim is the PI on a Canadian national consortium for rare disease, and, and she and Several of her colleagues, not including me, uh, wrote a really lovely review article in Nature Reviews of Genetics that came out a few months ago, and these last couple tables have been taken from that. As, as is this grant, uh, as is this, this uh, table as well. Um, and this is a table just discussing, again, the importance of these innovative therapies for potentially shift, shifting that therapeutic curve in the direction we want to go. So different approaches uh, can be used for loss of function disorders or, or gain of function disorders. Loss of function disorders, you're trying to restore the function somehow. So correcting splicing, uh, replacing the protein. So enzyme replacement therapies, of course, have been very important for treating lysosomal storage diseases. I know someone sitting in the room works on those. Uh, increasing the protein activity through translational read-through read or for providing chaperones or for inhibiting degradation of proteins. All these kinds of things are innovative approaches toward providing a function where no gene function exists. 
And then when the nature of the disease is a gain of function, so it's a dominant allele, then you need to turn down that gain of function. And so RNA interference or antisense RNAs or small molecule type inhibition, these are all potential approaches for treating those. And again, what's exciting about many of these kinds of therapies is that they're potentially, they're potentially generalizable to more than one disease. Okay. So what IRDIC is trying to foster and what members of IRDIC sign on to when they come on board is to obligate their researchers who are getting funding to comply with certain policies and guidelines. And I should be clear about this. So if the Institute of Health Carlos III wants to count a project toward its $10 million commitment, then that project should follow the IRDIC policies and guidelines. That does not preclude the Institute of Health Carlos III from funding some other projects that don't follow these guidelines. For, ha for instance, projects that would have a lot of IP attached because a product might be getting developed and you don't want to share the data, but that project shouldn't be counted toward the $10 million. Okay, so this isn't meant to inhibit proprietary research, but it is asking that the research that's meant to count toward the IRDIC commitment follows these guidelines. I also should be clear that we have been able to recruit a number of private sector you know, companies to, to the project. We're not asking companies to divulge anything or share anything that they don't already put in the public domain. It would be counterproductive to developing 200 new therapies by 2020 if we ask companies to come in and give away their IP and you know, so it's just, it's not feasible, they won't do it, but it also doesn't seem to be consistent with IRDIC goals. So the expectation is only that companies talk in general terms about the disease areas they're interested in, about the general approaches they're taking, and about the relative size of their commitment to those, to those areas. Okay, so these policies and guidelines have to do what we want the researchers to do is more sharing of data and resources, uh, not sitting on their data, but releasing it, making it public as soon as possible. Collecting their data, we've put a lot of emphasis on this, collecting their data in a way that allows other researchers to access it. So interoperability of databases so that one can talk to another one. Uh, harmonization of data so that a phenotype that's scored in Toronto is called the same thing as the same phenotype that's scored in Cambridge or in Barcelona. Uh, and putting data as much as possible into open access databases. Uh, we also want to see, um, we've, we are developing standards, for instance, in how you should, um, how you should store exome data, what's the, what's the limit, how many, um, how deep the coverage should be before it's acceptable, that kind of thing. Uh, developing standard ontologies and natural histories for disease progression. And one real problem in the area is that people put a lot of effort into databases and biobanks and things like that. And my own funding agency, and I think most others, are, can be accused of somehow not treating those kinds of core resources with the importance they deserve. And it's a very important metric for our funders is to see that the core resource is being used. So it is really important when researchers publish something that uses a database or uses a biobank that they make it clear that they did and they cite that somehow in the publication. Otherwise, it, it becomes very difficult for people who are trying to get funds to maintain that thing to make a case that it's actually being, that it's valuable to the community. Um, IRDIC also is dedicated to in patient involvement in research. And so we expect that all IRDIC funded projects will act in the best interest of patients. They'll involve patients in all the aspects of the research, uh, in the governance of registries, uh, in the design, the conduct, and the analysis of clinical trials to the extent possible, and also importantly to acknowledge the very important contributions made by patients in the research articles that result from, uh, in part, from, from their contributions. And what burdens do we put on ourselves as members? Uh, we want to be funding projects that promote the discovery of genes because we're trying to get new diagnostics, to promote the development of therapies because we're trying to get new therapeutics, uh, to fund preclinical studies, to get proofs of concepts for new 
uh, central therapeutics, again, to put some money behind the promotion of harm data harmonization and interoperability of databases and sharing and open data access, uh, to promote better coordination between the researchers we fund who work on rare diseases in people and the researchers we fund who work on animal models. I recently joined the scientific uh, executive of the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium. Uh, and they wanted me on there because they want to make, so this is a bunch of people who are getting something like a billion euros too, to knock out every mouse gene and to do deep phenotyping of every mouse gene. Okay? And this should become a really valuable resource to rare disease research. And they wanted me on the executive to try to bring the two communities together better. So what I learned from them, and I don't know whether this is just a, a vicious rumor, but what I learned from them is that there are something like 4,500 genes for which there's a mouse phenotype, but the corresponding human gene has no known clinical phenotype. So it's hard to imagine that there aren't a whole lot of undiscovered rare disease genes in there. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of value to be gained by closer coordination between those two communities. Um, this is maybe a bit off topic, but one thing we're trying to promote is there's a bioinformatician in Cambridge uh, who works in coordination with mouse groups, and he's developed a software package where you can take a human exome and search it through a database to see if you get any variants in genes that have a mouse phenotype. And I was surprised, as a bit of a naive, naive person, that gene calling software doesn't necessarily look at animal model data. And so he's developed a package to do that, and we're doing a little pilot with a bunch of unsolved exomes in Canada to see if the, running it through the software actually helps us find anything. Uh, okay. So how will we know that irdic has been successful? What kinds of things can we count to see if we're doing anything good? So for research activity, we can count how many members we have. Hopefully it keeps going up, and we can uh, count the budget that they've allocated to rare disease research, and hopefully that keeps going up. Um, for diagnostics, we can count the number of causative genes discovered. We can count the number of clinical tests of new diagnostics. Uh, we can show, generate the kinds of maps that I showed you before on the number of diseases with available tests. And something that's not on here, but we probably ought to start tracking, is how many centers there are that do diagnostic whole exome or whole genome sequencing, because that's starting to come on board in, in several jurisdictions. Uh, for therapeutics, of course, we can count number of new designations, number of clinical trials, number of diseases covered, what kinds of therapeutics uh, we're talking about, as well as number of disease uh, registries and sources of clinical data. So here are the present lists of IRDIC funder members. Lots of flags on here, so you can see it's become uh, truly a, a worldwide organization. So we're, on, we're, we're present in four continents. Uh, we have the European Commission, of course, in many European countries. In North America, we've got many organizations in the US, and we also have CIHR and Genome Canada in Canada. In Asia, we've got the BGI, as I mentioned, and also a consortium of institutions, uh, the, the Chinese Rare Disease Research Consortium. Uh, we also have the Korean NIH uh, as, a, as an Asian member. Uh, and finally, we have a hospital in Georgia, and I haven't decided whether Georgia's in Europe or Asia, so I always mention them separately. Okay, so altogether, 36, uh, 36 funders. Uh, as I said, new members are always wanted, so we're still, the door is open for any organization that wishes to join, uh, public or private, profit or nonprofit, as long as there's a minimum commitment of $10 million in rare disease research, and as long as there's a willingness to follow the IRDIC policies and guidelines. Uh, every funder member that joins gets a seat on the executive committee and can nominate one new member either to one, of the, whoops, to one of the scientific committees or one of the working groups. And so here for the next few minutes, I just need to talk a little bit about how the organization is governed. I don't want to get too much into this because this gets really boring. But the point I want to make is that we've intentionally developed a kind of a bottom-up governance system here. So here's the executive committee, and the executive committee is composed of people like Pedro and me who work for granting agencies and our funders. And what we really want to do is hear from scientists as to what they think the priorities for rare disease research should be. 
So in order to accomplish that, we've set up three different scientific committees, one focused on each of the two goals, the new diagnostics and the new therapies, and this one which we call interdisciplinary, which deals with ethical, legal, social issues that are transversal to, to, to both of these. And in turn, each of these scientific committees is advised by three working groups that, I'm sorry, by four working groups that look at more specific areas of their mandate. So there are 15 or so people who sit on each of these scientific committees, and there are 10 or so people who sit on each of these working groups. So we've worked out a way where about 150 of the most prominent researchers in rare disease in the world can feed information into us where we hopefully make intelligent decisions that are based on what we definitely get as intelligent advice. So I think we are trying to really run IRDIC in a way where we hear from the community and we respond to what the research priorities that are being defined by researchers in the area and not coming down from, on, uh, from us. And I'm not going to go through all these lists, but just to, I do want to point out the impressive Spanish contribution that's being made here. So Pedro um, has recently joined the executive committee as the representative from the, from the uh, Institute of Health, Carlos III. Uh, as I said, the, so the majority of funder of members are national funding agencies or regional funding agencies, so there are 24 of those. And then we have several industries, so we have seven companies, two big pharmas and five biotechs in this area. Three patient organizations are um, not funder members, but are considered to be members of the organization as well, so that we hear from patients. So your, oops, so Eurortis and the National Organization for Rare Disorders in the U.S., and the Genetic Alliance, also in the U.S., are, take part in this organization. Uh, and then we have a variety of other groups, like research institutes. This is a private research institute in the States. Uh, consortia of research institutes, the thing in China. Uh, the Georgian thing is a hospital that self-funds its own research. And then the ERARE 2 consortium is also a member of the organization. Um, these are the three scientific committees. Uh, so on the diagnostic, and you'll see there's, a, there's someone from Spain on each one. Uh, so Xavier Esteville is on the diagnostics committee, and hopefully those of you who work in this area recognize some of these other names on, on the committee. This is chaired by Kim Boycott in Canada. Uh, this is the interdisciplinary committee, and Angel uh, Caracedo is uh, from Spain. He's a member of that committee, and it, this is chaired by uh, Hans Lockmuller in, in Newcastle. And this is the Therapeutics Committee, and someone from where? Oh yeah, uh, Josep Torrent uh, Ifanel, uh, who used to be on the uh, uh, who used to be the chair of this committee, still serves as a member. Jan Lacam, who is the chair of Eurortis, has uh, taken over the chair of this committee as well. Okay, and Irdik also has Irdik has no central budget, but it does have a budget for a secretariat. Uh, which has been provided by a support grant from the European Commission, and that's been in place in Paris since uh, the end of 2012. And I am grateful to the Secretariat for administrative assistance, for, for instance, for putting together many of these slides, uh, and also for managing the website. So if you do want to learn more about IRDIC, there is a website, www.irdic.org, which is pretty actively maintained. This is a home page from it that was taken just a little while ago. We try to keep, uh, we featured new initiatives, uh, including new initiatives that are being funded by any of our members. We try to also focus on major uh, research achievements there. And all IRDIC documents were dedicated to transparency, so minutes of our meetings and all that kind of thing, uh, for those of you who are interested, can be found there. Okay, I think I have about 15 minutes left. Is that right? Timekeeper? Okay, good. So um, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about this Canadian consortium, uh, and then a few more minutes just talking about a couple of emerging activities uh, that IRDIC is engaged in now. So this Canadian project was initially called FORGE for finding of rare disease genes, uh, and it's now had a second incarnation of funding, and it's now called Care for Rare. And I think this really is an example of a, a successful national 
Rare Disease Research Consortium, and I think it, we, it proves on a small scale that collaboration produces results. So back in 2010, Genome Canada and CIHR had some money that it wanted to spend in this area, and also in the area of pediatric cancer. And we did something we'd never done before. We got research together and we said, you have to form a national consortium. We don't want to fund comp you guys to stay in silos and compete against each other. And we want to see two national consortia, one in rare disease and one in pediatric cancer. And these are going to go out to peer review if you put these, so you're going to have to convince international reviewers that these consortia are plausible. And although there's $5 million in the pot, we haven't decided what the proportion is going to be, so the, the peer reviewers are going to advise us about that as well. So it was, we only expected a single national consortium in each, in this, in each area, but we did make it a kind of a competition. And we were happy that the rare disease folks came together better and got two-thirds of the money, although some really nice data came out of the, of the pediatric consortia as well. So this team has gotten quite a lot of traction. This just came out last Friday uh, in the Toronto Golden Mail, which is the biggest, uh, the biggest English language newspaper in Canada. That's Kim. And as you can see, in, for, for those few million dollars in a little over two years, they discovered uh, the causative genes for 146 uh, rare childhood diseases. So we think that's a pretty good record. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple of slides that she's prepared on this. So that worked out to about one gene per week. So when we think about what a laborious project it used to be before next, next generation sequencing discovered genes, they got 146 in about 146 weeks. So, so that's really pretty good. Uh, and so the objective of the project was to rapidly identify these genes. So it was a two-year project that ran from 2011 to 2013. This is the first iteration of it, about $5 million to establish this national consortium for rare disorders. And we had a, the meeting that got this together was held on a really hot day like this. Believe it or not, we have really hot days in Canada. And it was held on a really hot day like this in a god-awful airport hotel in Toronto in July. And we were able to get most of these individuals from all over the country to fly in there. Many of them didn't know each other, and many of them who did didn't really like each other because they competed with each other. And in the course of two days, they were able to kind of pull this thing together, and that's real testimony to, to Kim's leadership, I think, uh, in, in getting that to happen. So eventually this involved 21 sites. So it sounds similar magnitude to what you have in Spain, 21 sites, 80, 80 treating physicians, and, and 50 different scientists involved with them. And in order to discover many of these genes, uh, unrelated families had to be found because many of these diseases were ultra rare. And so FORGE was very active in, in collaborating internationally. So the little stars here all over the world map are different countries that, uh, that FORGE has collaborated with. And Spain has a star on it. So there must be a collaboration with a, at least one group here and uh, the folks there. Okay, and some interesting, this, this slide didn't, wasn't right, it's 146 now, and this slide was made with only 110, but, the, but the, uh, the proportions here are, I think, kind of interesting. So of everything they looked at, they were able to solve 60% of the gene, of the, uh, so they looked at 184 disorders, and at that point it solved 60% of them. And I think that percentage went up a little bit by the end. Uh, and then of the ones they solved, about half of them were novel genes, uh, and then about half of them, I guess, were wrongly diagnosed and came up with, a, with, a, with an existing gene. And then of the one that were unsolved, about a third of them, there was no variant that made any sense. But the more common problem was that there were too many variants. So you couldn't choose among uh, some variants that remained. I'm going to get back to that point, what we want to do about that right at the end of the talk. So the rule of one third, then, is that when you, at least in there, situation when they did this project out of everything, a third of them were novel genes, got solved. Another third also got solved, but it was a, no, it was a gene that was already known and it hadn't been solved before because it was an atypical phenotype or may have just been wrongly diagnosed. Uh, 
actually some, a significant number of these patients had two diseases. Uh, and so something that presented as something that was really ultra rare actually turned out to be that the, the poor individual had two different things that were both known. And occasionally new mechanisms, new alleles of a, of a, of a known disease gene. And then the final third are ones that were unsolved and need more work. And there, those broke down that about two thirds of those, there was too many variants. So, based in part on that experience, um, Erdic is developing an action plan to try to address some of the particular issues that arose from those kinds of projects and to promote better standards for sharing data to facilitate better gene discovery. And so one thing, one big problem when people start trying to share information in this area is that different people, different, even different large-scale projects have been using different phenotypic terms for the same thing. And so different databases are not exactly cross-compatible because the same phenotype is, is, there's not a controlled vocabulary for phenotype. And so starting with a workshop in Paris that Segal and me organized in September 2012, and this was sponsored by Eurogentest and USERD, uh, this was the first discussion to agree to define a core set of terms that everybody would use uh, and a methodology so that all these different databases here that are common in the field would become cross-compatible. Uh, and I think we'll put these in this order. Next, there was a workshop that was organized by Erdic that was held right after the um, the Dublin IRDIC conference, where again, people from these major projects and databases came together. And this was sponsored by University of Dublin, by FORGE, and again by Eurogentest. And this was to really try to sort out how best to do this. So the, the Paris meeting said, yup, it's a good idea to do it. And here in the Dublin meeting, there was a conclusion that the human phenotype ontology and the orphanet database of ontologies would become the, the rare disease ontology, I'm sorry, would become the common standard. And then this would be cross-referenced with OMIM, which is a big database that's in the US. We couldn't quite agree OMIM, get OMIM to follow the same standard, but we did agree that, in, that the two would be able to reference each other. And so that was hashed out in a couple difficult days in Dublin. And then in Boston at the American Human Genetics meeting, Another workshop was supported by the Human Varium Project and by Eurogentest. This was organized by Clint, uh, Ada Hamash, who runs ClinVar in the States. Uh, and they followed up on this proposal and selected a common language of 2,370 terms and proposed that these would now be adopted by all databases. And so this led to this establishment of a new consortium that agreed on this and publication of these definitions on the IRDIC website. So this was a lot, of, this was people sitting in a room for two days, a room with no windows, with an Excel sheet, deciding in about 30 seconds on each term in order to get through 2,500 of them in, in two days. So incredible amount of work. Uh, and it involved a lot of compromise and consensus building from organizations that previously did their own thing. So we're very proud of that achievement. I think it's really the first real tangible achievement, uh, aside from just getting funding out, um, that IRDIC's been able to, to, to really foster. And I think this will, this will certainly, in the future, make it easier to identify when a patient in a project in one country actually has a similar phenotype to a patient that you might be working on in your own country. Okay, and so how this is working now, so these are all the, so we, well, maybe I just, too much detail and not enough time. Uh, so now what are we gonna do about increasing the rate of these diagnostics? And so I think this is a kind of a cute graphic. And so we always, as funders, we're always telling people to go after the low hanging fruit, you know, so there's the low hanging fruit. And probably the disease genes that have been discovered in 2012, 2013 by exome sequencing have been primarily the low-hanging fruit. They've been the not super rare diseases and they've been straightforward new uh, Mendelian changes in, in sensible genes. Uh, the ones that remain to be discovered are likely somewhat more complicated. 
And we can look at a pyramid, so yeah, like that. And so we can look at a pyramid of what kinds of complexity there might be in the discovery of new disease genes. So the base here, the easy ones, relatively easy ones, are rare coding, rare mutations in coding genes. And that's mostly what we're finding. And you get them by whole exome sequencing or maybe by whole genome sequencing. Interestingly, as an aside, almost all of them have still been exome sequencing. There are not very many that have been discovered by whole genome sequencing. So the next step of complexity are the ultra-rare coding mutations. And these are similar. They're still in the coding region, so if you can match them, you can identify them. But they're really rare, so trying to find two families that have the same thing is really difficult. And so the way to get at that is to foster better data coordination for unsolved exomes. Uh, and then moving up the pyramid, the next hardest ones are going to be non-coding mutations. And those you'll have to get by either whole genome sequencing or maybe by RNA sequencing. And then you get into the really hard stuff like epigenetics and oligogenetic modifiers where we really don't have the technology yet to do that. And even here, we don't really have the technology yet to call important variations in non-coding DNA. So let's get back to this and let's, and I'd like to close then by talking about an initiative that's underway to try to improve this part. And this is what we like to call the genetic matchmaker system. And so we've been able, again, it was at the Boston uh, American Human Genetics meeting last year we got representatives from most of the big diagnostic genomics projects that are going on around the world. And as I said when I introduced the work from Care for Rare, the biggest reason you can't call an ex solve an exome is because you have too many variants. And so every one of these projects has generated a bunch of unsolved exomes, that, and there are variant calls for those exomes. So the idea here is say, well, can we look at your, can we look at each other's unsolved exomes and see if there's a match? So I might have an unsolved exome that has five variants in it. And then if you've got one that also has five variants, but there's an overlap and the phenotypes are similar, then maybe we've got the match and maybe we've got pretty strong evidence that that common variant is actually the one that's causative. So matchmaker workshop. So, so at this Boston conference, the groups have more or less agreed that this would be a good thing to do. And so now the issue is, okay, but how do we do it? There are consent issues involving moving data around. And then more importantly, perhaps, the databases are constructed differently. So there's also technical and computational work involved in, in, trying, to, in, in trying to actually share the data. And so this is now being looked at. We think the consent issues can mostly be solved by leaving the data where they are, but developing a searching mechanism so that, think of like the, you know, the kayak travel agent thing or you know, those web-based things where you search 10 websites at the same time to find the best deal. So the architecture will be something where you can go on a search engine with your unsolved exomes and it'll come back and tell you there's a hit and I'm in Canada, it'll tell me there's a hit in Leiden. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the architecture that's being developed. Um, there also seem to be fewer consent issues about sharing variant calls as opposed to sharing the exomes themselves. So that's another way around this. Uh, and then we now have two of the, whoops, we now have two of the working groups involved in, but we have one working group that's looking exactly at that. What is the best way to do this given existing consents? And then the second group is looking at writing an API uh, to connect whatever data is deemed to be discoverable. And we expect that that software will be operational by the fall of this year. And that, in fact, it is operational now for one pair of sites. Uh, and another pair should, another one should be online very shortly. We hope to have this operational for most of those groups by the fall of 2014. So once again, a real practical, uh, practical effort to foster better collaboration in this area. Uh, and on the IRDIC website, the list of databases that have agreed to do this and can be connected by this software um, will be available. 
So I think I've used up my time. I thank you a lot for your attention. It got cooler in here, too, as I was talking, at least up here. Uh, so thanks a lot, and I'm happy to take your questions.